Hello, I'm Amanda Williams, and I'm going to talk about how to find good research on pain. Anyone who has a problem such as pain and wants to get rid of it needs to know what's best to try, what's safe to try, and whether it works better than just waiting and getting better naturally. With chronic problems, waiting hasn't made them better. Suppose you hear about some new treatment. How can you tell if it really works and is worth trying? To answer that, you could see if there's any research on it, but you need to know who does the research and who pays for it. Much research is done in universities, paid for by taxes, by charities, and by private companies. Taxpayers and charities, of course, hope to see benefits to patients from the research, new cures, symptom relief, easy ways to diagnose problems, or even prevention. Private companies hope for the same, but also aim to make money from their discoveries. Funders of research can therefore influence what research is done by what they decide to fund or not fund. Much funding is run through competition. The money goes to the teams with the best ideas, at least in the funder's eyes. The research teams are then expected to deliver on their promises and to make their findings public for anyone else to build on. It's from making knowledge about the COVID virus public that vaccines could be developed so fast. So what can you trust of what you find on the internet? If you're in the UK, one of the top sites to come up will usually be an NHS site. The NHS provides information for patients with answers to frequently asked questions and more detailed summaries of the research with guidelines such as from NICE about treatment methods. Just search for NHS information plus the name of the problem or treatment you want information about. One of the other videos in this Footsteps Festival is about the Cochrane Collaboration, which does gold standard reviews and provides plain language summaries that explain the results of the research to everyone. Another video is about different types of research. On the internet, you also find information from universities, medical centers and major bodies in other countries, such as the National Institutes for Health, NIH in America. All these are generally trustworthy as they are accountable to the public. But particularly if you look for something more specific or for new treatments, you'll also come across many claims of rapid and total cures. Many are expensive, but have persuasive stories. Few are accountable to the public or to people with a problem. Their purpose is to sell the pills or devices or hands-on treatment. That doesn't mean that they don't work, but they're rarely properly tested to see if they do work and if there are any risks. So how can you apply what you find to your pain? Research findings are often expressed as average results over a large number of people, and the average might apply to you, but it might not. Average results are made up of lots of people getting close to the average effect, some doing better and some doing worse. As an example, we're not all the average height for our age and sex, but that doesn't make tall or short people abnormal, it's just natural variation. We not only vary in height and build, but in our body chemistry and of course in our genes. So what provides a 20% improvement on average for a thousand people will give a few people much bigger improvement and some no improvement at all with a few getting worse. If we try a new treatment on a thousand people and none of them has a bad reaction, we can be fairly sure it's safe for most people. But if a treatment's only been tried on 50 people, it's quite possible that one in a hundred might have a really serious adverse effect. You wouldn't want to be that one in a hundred. At present, research often starts in the lab with reactions and interactions being studied in test tubes. Then it's tested in animals with reasonably similar body chemistry to ours to see how safe it is and if it still looks promising. Only if it passes animal tests is it tried on healthy human volunteers and then finally on real patients. There's no guarantee that it will help sick people, even where it seems to be good for animals and volunteers, or that there won't be unpleasant side effects. So how can you become more involved in research? There are lots of ways that people, particularly people with an illness or disability and those close to them can help to improve research. 
they can contribute to consultations about research priorities. When disease-based charities do this, it often moves pain up the agenda. They can volunteer to help research teams as patient representatives, discussing how to make participating in research an interesting and satisfying experience for people, and how to spread the results at the end of the research project. And patients can agree to take part in research when they're asked at an appointment in a hospital clinic or GP surgery. Then when there is already lots of research to combine, NICE and other bodies involve patients in drawing up guidelines. And some people read the research and write their own blogs or write for patient newsletters to share what they found. All of these ways of getting involved are valuable. Pain research needs a stronger voice from those who stand to benefit most from it people with pain.